Many years ago, around the time of iPhone 1, so this was quite some time ago, Spotify had some big maintainability problems with the uh, desktop client. And we, have, we had been around for quite some time, and the code base had grown wildly. It was at that point, you know, when, where a software eventually gets, where everybody is afraid to change something, because if you do, you end up breaking something else. To make matters even more complicated, we had a code base that was all C++, which is known for many good things, but perhaps not maintainability or the ease of finding programmers for it. And also, we, uh, all the rendering was custom made. There was no QT or WinForms or anything like that. Uh, so you had to so you had to learn all these things from the beginning, and as a result, development was moving really slowly, and that is a lethal disease for a company in Spotify situation. So today, I'm going to tell a tale about these dark ages of Spotify. So Spotify has over 60 million users, says my notes, uh, but the day before yesterday we actually announced new uh, numbers. So as well, I was about to compare this to the population of Italy, but now we have 75 million us users, so we're actually closing up on the population of uh, Germany, which is 81 million. So we're probably going to pass you guys this year. So we're the biggest revenue source of the music industry in Europe right now, uh, and we're growing really, really fast. My name is Matthias Petter Johansson, uh, MPJ for short, to find me on the internet. Uh, and I am one of the developers who work on the Spotify desktop <coughs> client. And that is our oldest client, so it has seen a lot. The story I am about to tell you has a moral. Duplication might be fine. When you're new to programming, one of the first things that you learn is to remove duplication. You learn to see that two different uh, parts of the code are the same. They're really the same and you break this out into a single general method and you use that instead. And removing duplication, that is so fundamental to our craft, right? That it becomes, over time it, it, it ceases to be just a tool. It becomes part of how we think. It becomes a principle, almost like a belief. Code duplication is bad. And that is what I used to believe. Uh, but this story is about how I and many other people at Spotify learned that removing duplication has some hidden costs. Sometimes very big costs. This talk is going to run about 40 minutes, if I calculated correctly. I will begin telling you about how the desktop client is architected. Uh, and also about how Spotify teams work, and a little bit about Hack Weeks. I will then move on to some uh, juicy Spotify inside history and tell you about something called Stitch uh, that caused us all kinds of problems, but that gave us two very important learnings, which, lead, uh, which led us to build Cosmos, which replaced Stitch. And these two learnings are actually what this talk is about. If you remember nothing else from this talk, uh, you should remember these two learnings, and I will tell them to you now. The first one is, only solve problems that exist. And the second one, only share mutual problems. And finally, I will talk about how Cosmos puts these two learnings into practice. Uh, I've left quite a bit of space uh, for questions at the end, hopefully. So when something is unclear, just make a mental note of that and fire away at me afterwards. 
And one final thing before I get into it. This talk is about the abstract problem of co-duplication. Uh, it, and it's weaved into this story about these juicy problems at Spotify. There will be no demos and there will be no code. Uh, and it will be like five slides or something. So in order to enjoy this talk, you need to set your brains to verbal, abstract, and uh, philosophical mode. So uh, here we go. <coughs> the Spotify desktop client uh, runs an instance of Chrome, inside the, which, which in turn runs a collection of small views called spotlets. And they make up the client. So playlist is one spotlet, the artist app is one spotlet, the uh, activity feed on the right is one spotlet, and uh, so on. They're all self-contained and they don't do much talking to each other. So how did spotlets come to be? Do you remember apps in apps? It was a craze for a while that Facebook got started. You remember this thing? I realized now that you might not, because in Germany, like, there was this other thing uh, uh, before Facebook. But either way, uh, around this time, Facebook apps, they were, uh, for the first few iterations, they were small modules that you put inside your profile. Uh, and this was before, uh, way before everything revolved around the feed. So uh, around this time, people communicated by going through the, to the walls and posting on that wall and then going back and posting on that wall. And that was how communication happened. So uh, wall apps were one of the most popular ones. And this was uh, especially, especially horrible. All of my uh, friends had this. It, it was generally a dreadful thing. Uh, and in order for you to understand the next part of the story, I must tell you about Spotify Hack Weeks. A Spotify Hack Week is a week when the entire company, not just tech, mind you, puts their normal job on the back burner and work on something else. It can be anything, as long as it doesn't hurt Spotify. So Hack Weeks are scheduled months in advance so that teams can make sure that they don't clash with any deadlines uh, and so that you can plan what to build. And the week before Hack Week, we hold a bunch of workshops so that you can learn systems that you're not familiar with, uh, and you're allowed to pitch your uh, hack idea to others so that you can get them to join your course. And uh, this is, it's all like this massive celebration of the hacker culture and creativity, and I think it's by far the best <coughs> perk about working at Spotify. And we have them about 1.5 times a year. And in one, uh, in one Hack Week, the Hack Week following the iPod integration project, the iPod, not the iPhone, this was way back. An engineer named Joan Larson rewrote parts of the desktop app using web views, running inside an instance of Chrome, running inside the desktop client. And web slash native hybrid apps like this, they are common nowadays, but back then they were really rare. And it turned out to be massive for Spotify because it meant that instead of having to learn C++, which is a language with a, with, with a pretty steep learning curve in itself, uh, and learning a ton of layout and rendering technology that was rare or non-existent outside of Spotify, a developer could now use standard web technologies to build apps. So the Spotlet was born. And Nowadays, the Spotify desktop client is completely built with uh, JavaScript, <laughs> or the UI is. Uh, it's resting on top of the same C++ core that the iOS and Android clients uses. Uh, the C++ core is responsible for things like uh, playback, or uh, providing offline editing of playlists, and uh, providing the local file support. But rendering and uh, interacting with the UI is all handled by JavaScript. And the communication between the C++ part and the JavaScript uh, parts are done through a simple messaging interface we call Bridge. Uh, the UI itself is HTML and CSS, and that is generated by handlebars and less. Oh. Spotify is one big product, but we're all made up of little islands. And that is both software-wise and organization-wise. 
Each, each spotlet lives in its own little sandbox, doesn't know about the outside world. The only communication that it does is through the, uh, to the C++ core via bridge or with its Cosmos service, which I will talk about in a bit. So it doesn't have access to the DOM outside itself. Each spotlet, since each spotlet is, uh, is so contained, we can deploy them independently. A spotlet is basically just a zip file of HTML and CSS and JavaScript and images. And the latest versions of these are bundled with the uh, big client binary when we release it. Uh, but we can also re uh, deploy these separately. And we can deploy them right into the running clients of, uh, of users without them even restarting the client. And that is very useful for emergency releases. But we can also release spotlets to certain user groups, like uh, employees or, uh, or testers. And we can even release apps that aren't originally bundled with the client at all. And this is really handy during Hack Weeks, because you can make an app and uh, demo it to people, uh, and then you can get it into the hands of non-techy decision makers in the company by saying that, hey, you should just, just enter this URI in your uh, in the search, search field of your normal Spotify client, and boom, there you go. You can try this hack out with your own account. And this island thinking that we have, it's also reflected in how Spotify teams are organized. So Spotify is internally divided into small teams that we call squads. And they are, can range from three to 12 people or so, but never diverge from more or less than that. A feature is generally owned by a single squad. And during normal conditions, the squad has all it needs to develop uh, their feature and, and maintain it. So you have, uh, we have iOS developers, Android developers, backend developers, and all that kind of stuff inside the, the squad. The general idea is that every squad should have the ability to do the work on their feature without needing to uh, needing to uh, go to another squad for, for per or, and ask for permission or for help. It should be minimized. So, um, and a squad also picks its own way of working. Scrum or, or Kanban or uh, maybe something custom and picks the tools and libraries that it determines to be the best fit for the problems that the squad is facing. The idea is that every squad should be like its own little mini startup, uh, tuned for only its specific sets of, of, of challenges. And almost every spotlet has a Cosmos service. The Cosmos service is a special kind <coughs> of backend service uh, that, um, that provides a, a, a single spotlet, and, and that spotlet only, with the data that it needs. The Cosmos service is owned by the same squad that, uh, that builds the Spotlet. And Spotify has well over 100 small uh, services running in the back end. And Cosmos services are stateless services that aggregate data from a bunch of other services uh, in order to provide the Spotlet with just the data that it needs, often in just a single network request. So. Through the Cosmos service, squads work directly with this big cloud of backend services that we have. And you might have thought about this now, and a lot of people become like, perplexed by it when they're coming to Spotify. Uh, they find it weird that there isn't a shared central API for stuff. If you have a lot of squads doing work all over the place, it seems to make sense to gather shared functionality in one place. And in fact, there used to be, and it was called Stitch. Stitch was the one central place where all the uh, spotlets could go for all their data fetching needs. It, uh, it, it was maintained by a central team, and it didn't work. Stitch taught us Two very important lessons that led us to build Cosmos. 
And those two lessons were, again, only solve problems that exist and only share mutual problems. Let's spend a bit of time on the first one, only solve problems that exist. As Spotify was built, we noticed pattern in how we were building things. Almost all apps needed to play things. They had playable lists, they dealt with playlists, artists, albums and tracks and so on. So we figured that it was a bad idea that developers solve these problems over and over. So along with the Spotlet architecture, Stitch was built. A framework for building Spotlets specialized at solving exactly the kind of challenges that we knew from experience that Spotlets would have. So Stitch abstracted away things like the player so that code could play a song. The code to play a song was exactly the same on both the, uh, the, de uh, the desktop client and the web client, even though the underlying implementation was, was the same, wasn't the same. Stitch also offered access to manipulating playlists and accessing uh, artist data and, and so on. It gave you the whole shebang. And the idea was that we wanted to give developers in the organization this set of Lego pieces that they could use, use to build apps really, really fast. But instead, Stitch made us really, really slow. And I'm sure a lot of you is going to recognize the kind of framework that I'm going to describe now. In the beginning, it works great. You throw up the first version really fast, and it works really well. And you're thinking, wow, this is going to make me so much more productive. I just have to fix these edge cases and these tweaks, and we're good to go. I'm almost done. And when you do, everything, your development starts slowing down to a crawl. The framework has made these assumptions that your app just doesn't fit cleanly into. And working around those assumptions is eating up a lot of your time. So Stitch, which was meant to save us time, was actually eating it. And now we're getting to like, the core of this talk. Why did Stitch end up this way? As programmers, when we see several instances of a problem, we see a pattern. And what is interesting about this, uh, this pattern recognition is that it is a part of our instincts as humans. It's not a learned skill. You can show a baby photos of a cat uh, another cat, a long-haired cat, a short-haired cat, 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 dog. And the baby will notice that there is a pattern difference. And humans make use of this pattern recognition all the time. For instance, you did it today. You saw that these chairs follow the uh, chair pattern and they are sittable. Uh, even though you have not seen this particular chair before, uh, you can use pattern recognition to figure out that this, this, is, this is the chair pattern, and you can thereby predict its properties. And humans are very, very, very good at pattern matching, but it has its limitations. And we are incredibly overconfident on, at how good we are at it. So the problem arises when we try to pattern match much more complex things than chairs, like uh, humans or, or, or code. It's then we get prejudice, racism, sexism, astrology, and stitch. When you're designing an API for anything, you need to understand the use case very well, right? You need to create, in order for you to create a uh, cohesive and, and useful <coughs> API. So for instance, let's say that you're designing a date handling API. You uh, research the edge cases and you uh, take in all this kind of information and use cases and you try to pattern match and predict all the methods that your API is going to need. If you are an experienced developer, you're probably going to be able to do this prediction and, and, and it's going to work out fine. However, if you expand the scope of your API to something wider, like way past date handling in scope and go to 
something like what Stitch did to Spotify. You're going to fail at predicting what a good and cohesive API for that looks like. And the reason that you can predict how a good date library API will look is that there's not a lot of innovation going on in the world of dates. But when you try to build a Spotify API, the only data that you can look at is what Spotify does today. But Spotify is an innovation company, like most companies, and per definition will try to do things that have not been done before. The fact that the last 10 features had similar needs cannot be used to predict the needs of the 11th because if we're doing our job as innovators, that means that the 11th one will have completely different needs. So what we learned is that it is a good thing to find a shared problem in your apps and making a small library to solve that problem in one place. But it's a bad thing to create an entire framework to solve a more general problem than the one that you're actually having. And that is because your mind incorrectly believes that the problem is more general than it actually is. So only solve problems that exist. That's the first learning that we have from Stitch. So let's talk a bit about the other learning. Only share mutual problems. At Spotify, we had a culture that said, if you wrote code for a problem, you should share it so that the entire organization could benefit, not just your team. And because of this sharing philosophy, it was natural that Stitch became the central framework of the organization. Almost everything went through Stitch. So whomever did something, whenever you did something, you did it through Stitch, which, also, which automatically made it available to all developers in the organization. But again, that slowed us down. Let's say that you, um, you have a piece of code that you need to change. And imagine that this code is inside, it's inside your app. And it's just, it's just normal inline code. It's just your code, nobody else is using it, so nobody's gonna write this code for you. So you spend a few hours doing this change. Now, instead imagine that this code is in a shared library. Depending on circumstances, your change might now take everything from minutes to weeks. And the best scenario is if you just look in the framework do documentation and you realize, hey, I don't need to make this change at all because there's already a method doing exactly what I want. That is the best scenario. The good scenario is the same except that the documentation is lacking, so you have to go into the source code and check things out, and you maybe have to find the author and uh, spend a bit of talking to him or her. But you finally figure out that you can solve your problem by passing the special parameter into the method. Uh, so this is still better than writing the code yourself. But the bad scenario is if you find that the change that you would do, uh, that you intend to do, it, it would break things for other people. So what you end up doing is adding a method to the API to do what you want. And we're losing a bit of time here because it's slightly slower than adding it to your own code. And this is because you're not very familiar with the framework code as your own code. Uh, so you have to get the, ch and you also have to get the change approved by the maintainers and to finally get a new version of the framework released. So in addition, nobody else is really using this method. It's only for your app. Uh, it's a pretty niche thing. So you're also just cluttering up the framework. That's a bad scenario because it's slightly so worse. So you're now s worse off than if you, uh, if you wrote the code yourself. But the worst scenario is if you find out that the person that wrote the code is no longer employed at Spotify. So you have to do some asking around, some social engineering to figure out who, 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 who knows about this code now. And you find out that there is a person, but they live in New York. And in New York, it's like 4 a.m. now. So 
after getting a hold of the person, they finally explain to you that the change that you want to make requires changing the framework at the core level and it will require a significant refactoring. So you have probably been in this situation. You find yourself, you, you just wanted to add an arrow graphic. But three days later, you're in the middle of this huge refactoring to solve like a sorting problem for the entire development organization. Even though you had no sorting in your app at all. So you, you, you're in this situation where you're doing work for other developers instead of producing value for your users. Not quite yet. So what went wrong here? So in Sweden we have this saying uh, that shared joy is double joy and shared sorrow it is half sorrow. And that is true, but only if it's mutual. Let's say that you meet a person at a party and all they talk about is uh, their uh, eczema, you know, skin rashes on their skin. And if you also have eczema, you are, uh, you, you're probably going to be able to spend a, quite a bit of time talking to this person, uh, maybe even uh, exchange treatment tips, because you have this thing in common, this problem. However, if you don't have any experience with eczema, you are probably going to find this person uh, uh, very boring and, and probably disturbing. And code, at its essence, is actually a solution to a set of problems that you're having. So when you share code, you are by extension sharing your set of problems with whomever uses it. And other people, when they work in that shared code, they are also putting their problems into it. And if your sets of problems, if they overlap a lot, this is a good thing because you're joining forces against those problems. However, if there isn't a great overlap between these problems, you, you're actually not just not helping each other out. You're just dumping problems on each other. So what we learned is that it is a good idea to pool resources with people that have the same problem as you. But it is a bad idea to pool resources just for the sake of pooling resources. Uh, because you're not just pooling your resources, you're also pooling <coughs> your problems. And if your problems don't match, you're actually just giving each other problems instead of helping each other out. Only share mutual problems. Which brings us back to Cosmos. To recap, a Cosmos service is a service that lives on the edge of this cloud of hundreds of backend services that Spotify has. And Spot uh, Cosmos is different from these main backend services, like, uh, for instance, uh, the playlist service or the track metadata service. They provide a single spotlet, and that spotlet only with the data that it needs. And the Cosmos service is owned by the same squad that builds the spotlet, and they have full control over it. They don't need to go through another squad or somebody else's code to get their work done. And Cosmos is a practical implementation of the first learning, only solve problems uh, that exist. We, we learned that we'll most likely fail if we try to predict what needs we will have in the future if the problem area is very complex and a lot of innovation is happening. So Stitch was very aware of what a playlist and an album is. And that is great when you are doing stuff with playlists and albums. But if you need to do things like uh, your music and podcasts, uh, things are going to start moving slow. And things are going to move really slow when you start doing completely different things like video. And instead, Cosmos picks a very straightforward problem that all squads share, and that is unlikely to uh, move, al move around like crazy. And that is data access. So Cosmos doesn't care about what data. The Cosmos infrastructure provides us with tooling to build small services that aggregate data from the main backend service, but it does not know what that data is. 
So Cosmos also solves authentication because that is another area where we can be reasonably sure that there's not going to be a crazy amount of change. And Cosmos is also a practical implementation of the learning only share mutual problems. So Cosmos services only support a single spotlet. Cosmos services don't try to solve problems for a wide range of cons consumers. The endpoints have very specific purposes and names like get artist page header or uh, get your music cover image metadata, which are super efficient and simple endpoints that get this data into the client really, really fast. So Cosmos services send only the data that it need is needed by one spotlet, and they only depend on the backend services that they need uh, to assemble their data. So they have very few dependencies. So Cosmos gives the spotlet its perfect API. Since the Cosmos service is adapted for only one spotlet, you never, you never have to fight the Cosmos API like you did with, with Stitch, with, which you had to mangle into your will. So it's tailored for one spotlet because it doesn't care about being anything to anyone else. The problem set of a squad is contained within the spotlet service. So that way we're keeping problems that aren't mutual out of each other's hair. So today I have told you about how the desktop client is architected and also about how Spotify teams work and a little bit about Hack Weeks. I then moved on to tell you about Stitch, our former big shared SDK. Uh, and how we learned two big things from it. Only solve problems that exist and only share mutual problems. And finally, I talked a bit about how we put those learning into practice with Cosmos. And my goal here was to give you a more nuanced view about code du duplication, delve into that problem a lot, because it's something that we all do, but perhaps that we don't think about it a lot because it's so self-evident for us. So I wanted to put a little voice inside your mind that sometimes reminds you that duplication might be fine. Thank you. <laughs> so I, I, just hit me with whatever questions you have about our architecture or something like this, stuff like that. Well, I guess the big question Oh, so how do you know when a, a problem goes from an individual problem to a mutual problem? <sighs> I, in a small organization, I guess that you talk, but in, uh, in a big organization, Spotify is like 1,800 people or something like that now. So basically, you, you don't really. That is, that is why it's so, so tricky. You just have to... You, ha you just have to know a lot of people and you have to talk to a lot of squads and figure out that, yeah, this squad does this, perhaps they have solved this, this issue. And you have to just, over time, just find these patterns. Uh, and I mean, I'm a big believer that you should, in order to generalize, you should create duplication a lot before removing it. So if a lot of people do the same kind of service, uh, the same kind of, uh, uh, Cosmos service, you will over time see that, oh shit, a lot of people are doing this. Then we can actually start, yeah, this is a very shared need. Now we need a dedicated real service for this. And you do that and then you start, uh, after you've done that, uh, which a squad probably does on its own. They just realize that a lot of people need this. They do it and they, uh, they broadcast it to the organization that, hey, we've, we've done this service, you can now use this. And uh, hopefully some people uh, realize that, uh, notice it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. In your Stitch era, do yeah. you have a domain model? Mm. Yes, we very much did. Uh, and that was probably the, the problem. Uh, the domain was extremely well specified. You had, uh, you had playlists, you had artists, you had 
uh, albums, but things got really messy once that, that domain started changing around. And a big mistake that we did was that all layers of the, the application structure was aware of, of the domain, so the domain was hard-coded into, uh, in, into bri Bridge knew about the domain, uh, the, the, um, the Stitch API know, knew about the domain, the, the core JS and core knew about the domain. So every time you had to make a change to the domain, uh, things started moving incredibly slowly because you had to walk through all these layers. And it was often different people that knew different things about these layers because all of them were written in different languages and different technologies. Does that answer your question? More. How do you handle all the diversity that emerges when every team has the freedom to choose its framework? Because actually, you know, in Germany, uh, when you do software, you want to bring it into your account so that it's value for the company and stuff. And then you bring in new people. Uh, how, do, how does Spotify handle that? Um, like in most cases, it's fine. Uh, like you just, people are very good at dealing with messes. <laughs> However, <laughs> there. <laughs> There, there are uh, situations where you really don't want people to, uh, stuff to change around. Uh, for instance, for quite a while, I don't rem know if you remember this, but at some time the Spotify client design was very weird. Like the, the fact that every squad was responsible for their own part, it really shone through in the design. We even had like uh, sections of the app that were white because that was, uh, that was the new design that we were moving towards and some squad had moved to it and, and others didn't. And it was generally a very weird experience. So in the area of design frameworks, you don't want things to move around a lot. You want them to have a, a kind of inertia. So we have this, we actually have a shared design framework called Glue, uh, which is sort of like what Stitch was. It was just this shared space where you find your design components uh, and they don't move around a lot and they are maintained by separate teams and everybody, if you want to change in there, it's slow, but it's supposed to be slow there. Because when people, when, and a lot of people depend on something, you don't want it to move around a lot because that will slow you down a lot. If you have, like, if you have a solid foundation that you work under, like an operating system or something, that is good if it's stable. You know that is predictable. You can build software on top of it. But if they, that is actively developed, you really can't rely too much on it. Does that answer your question? In part. Yeah. <laughs> but how do you really Yeah. And then the guy shows something, uh, live coding in coffee, and then half of mm. the audience mourn. They say, ooh, coffee. And oh, yeah. And every time you introduce a new obscure or esoteric language or something, or you could, yeah. at Spotify, I imagine I could, you know, write some uh, spotlet in white space. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? Uh, I think the Spotify, uh, Spotify deals with it partially because we actually have a very tech, skeptical culture. Um, the, the people see us as a new company, but we've, as you've heard during this talk, we've actually been around for quite some time. And there was a time in the back end when um, uh, people were allowed to write stuff with anything. And right now, you're allowed to choose between Python and Java, and you should choose Java. <laughs> it's, uh, it's that kind of... So I think it's a cultural thing. You just have to... Uh, have a culture with restraint. That said, I still think that we might right now be erring on the side of wild, uh, especially when it comes to JavaScript. Uh, right now, every, uh, every spotlet is essentially an iframe, which gives you like, this tremendous freedom of doing whatever kind of crazy shit you want. Uh, so you can, there are uh, squads doing uh, CoffeeScript stuff, kind of frowned upon, but you're allowed to do it. Uh, and, uh, and I think that we're going a bit overboard with it. And the trend is to s like scale it back a little and try to find shared frameworks and, and some kind of balance there. But I, don't, I think it's ba basically you have to have a culture of restraint. At least that's how we solve it. Okay. More. 
we have independent teams, do they all have like independent build systems? Uh, so if I move from to uh, squad A to squad B, yep. does that mean potentially that they're using completely different build setup and testing tools and whatnot? Uh, no, uh, because that is the kind of infrastructure that you want to provide. I mean, all squads need a build system. Uh, and you have, um, like, the, the back end squads are more firm than the front end squads. Uh, back end squads basically all use, they, they all use the same thing. They, u they use the puppet thing for deployment, and they, they use, all use the same, same infrastructure. The, uh, um, the front-end teams all use Grunt. That is not forced. You're allowed to use Gulp. Uh, but in the end, if there is infrastructure available in a company, the, there becomes a certain pool to, uh, to use that. I mean, uh, if there is tons and tons of tons of tooling available to you that actually, actually makes you faster and not just, it just isn't just forced upon you, then you tend to want to use that because it may, will make you will simply make your job easier, uh, or at least also it, it's a responsibility thing because you know that hey if I use this I can actually ask somebody else to fix it and they, because and they will because it's their job. Uh, so I think that uh, it's it's a good thing to provide strong tooling to uh, create an incentive to use certain systems. No, it might be no, not uh, if you're moving from back end to front end. Yeah, then it, then it will be a change. But so that was the first thought that popped into my head that uh, being able to develop very quickly or paying the price of not being able uh, to swap around developer sets. Yeah, and this this might be also asked because JavaScript is what JavaScript is. It's like when people come into JavaScript, there's oh my god, there's so many frameworks. There's frameworks everywhere. Where do I start? What set of things do I use? And that is true. It's, it's like a, JavaScript is, replaces framework like most people replace socks. But Java, the JavaScript community is also very trendy. Uh, so people tend to move towards the same trend. Uh, so it, there's, there's some cohesion that is added there because people follow, all, all people read Hacker News. And Hacker News dictates that this is the new framework. And now people get familiar with that. Any more questions? Any more detailed technical questions? I haven't shown you a lot of code today. Do you want to know some more specifics? No code questions, sorry. <laughs> but I was wondering how you can uh, QA because uh, you can like spend and then you would know, of course, you know, uh, it might work well. I just wanted to make sure that it works well. Yeah. Yeah, uh, QA is, we actually have QA in the squad. So we, we have, a, uh, in my squad, we have two developers and one QA. Uh, we're a very small squad, and I know that the desktop container squad, I don't know how many QAs they have, but it's a lot. I think it's almost as many as the developers. Uh, and uh, they work very tightly with the employees, uh, with, the <laughs> with the developers. Um, uh, on, on site, I mean, I have my QA like right behind me, uh, and everything basically goes through her. Uh, we, uh, we have this system of P1 and P2 and P3 bugs. P1 bugs uh, refer to bugs that were discovered in production and that you really need to fix right now. Uh, and P2 bugs are bugs that we classify as uh, things that block the release. So if the, the, the QA says that, yeah, I think this is a P2 bug, and you can, you can sometimes argue that it's a P3, but if it's a P2 bug, that blocks the release. Uh, so it's very important in this kind of structure to let the QA be the gatekeeper of stuff. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yes. And I, I assume you go to QA too, right? Yeah. You don't have, uh, you know, different test frameworks and so on. Oh. All right. Uh, we, at Spotify, we separate, uh, like, 
the role of QA and we have a special role called TA, which stands for Test Automator. Uh, QA tend to like come into the company as QA and then move, it's, it's, like start doing TA. Uh, so we use a multitude of testing depending on the squad. We use, we have actually started to do the, uh, the thing that Google launched a couple of years ago, uh, the test certified system where you just get a level for your squad of how advanced you are at testing. Um, but um, almost all squads use this graph walker framework, which was invented by a guy at Spotify. So you create this, these graphs, these models of how a, um, a, an automated test should go through the application. Uh, and uh, it, it kind of randomizes the path and does all kinds of clicking and stress testing and go through, uh, they, it goes first to the playlist, clicks that, and then goes play, and then it goes back, but it might not do the same uh, uh, the next time it goes. And then it, it, it logs all those, um, uh, those things as screenshots, logs a console output, and that kind of stuff. So it's basically, an, it's sort of an automated QA. Um, and in addition to that, we have a bunch of test frameworks. We're using uh, Phantom JS to do uh, this kind of intermediate step because the TA tests are great, but they are also very slow because you have to spin up an entire uh, entire um, uh, environment with like real services and stuff. Uh, so you can like you can have a hundred of them tops, even though we have this big cluster running them. Uh, so you need this middle ground test that mock out the back end uh, and. Uh, and just test the UI, but with a real browser. So it clicks around, and th we do that with Phantom JS. And then we just, uh, besides that, we add a bunch of unit tests, which just tests the, uh, the, the JavaScript controller. And then Core, of course, uh, has its own suite of, of unit tests. I think that other squads might be doing some kind of integration testing between things, but I think that those are the ones that most squads do. And, uh, and uh, when it comes to tooling, you, uh, yeah, that, that is tooling that is provided. And I think that is also why people are doing these kinds of tests, because they are the tests that we provide tooling for. So people tend to do them. Not all of them, because their needs might differ. But yeah, if tooling is provided, people tend to do it. So what would your estimate is your overall coverage with testing? No. Uh, uh, I don't know. Are you a believer in test coverage? No. Um, I'm just collecting what others do. Yeah, we just, we just added test coverage to an app, and it, I got a Slack notification now that, oh, this looks weirdly high. Mm -hmm. But it, it's just because the way the app is built, all the, it, like every single test will execute pretty much all of the code because it just fires off these watchers and stuff. Uh, no, I'm not sure what the overall test coverage is. I know that some squads have insane test coverage. Uh, they, they aim for 100, and some squads, yeah, yeah, we have 80, and it's fantastic. Uh, I don't think that we aim too much of it. We, we, I, I think that Spotify has uh, the opinion that it is important to measure test coverage, because that just does something with your attitude, that just watching this number go up and down uh, makes you start thinking about test coverage. Oh, is this, is this test? covered or not, uh, that just puts you in a good frame of mind. But the figure itself, it might not mean that that much. It might not be able to. It's, it's high for some squads. And I have one additional question. So if you ask yeah, sure. Go. You talked about a lot of uh, very distinct and small, so it's basically some sort of microservice architecture with hundreds of services. Yes. So how is that uh, orchestrated so that the right service in the right version yeah. is running and yeah. So you can test it on your desktop and so it runs in production. Yes. Uh, it is uh, a Puppet, basically. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, Puppet is used a lot at Spotify. Um, we, uh, but um, we're moving, I mean, we're moving to a Docker architecture. Uh, it's still not getting a lot lot of traction in the organization because the back-end people are again super skeptical people uh, but uh, the, the, uh, the infrastructure teams are are pushing docker 
Uh, when it comes to like getting it to run on your own machine, most I think that I don't see much backend developers working on their machines. Uh, they uh, they they tend to. We have this thing called Body Cloud, which is basically a framework on top of Amazon Web Services, which allows the de uh, developers to buy instances <laughs> really quickly. Uh, so you just hit SP Cloud Create, and boom, you have a uh, you have a, you have a server uh, that you can install stuff on, and that you can just add Puppet classes on. So I don't know if you all know Puppet, but it's basically just this file that can inherit other files that defines what a, what should be installed on a server. So you just tell, you just go Spotify Cloud Create, okay, and I want the, the web player class, for instance, and then you go get a coffee, and then uh, things will install on your uh, your machine, and will, you will have this complete thing. Um, so that is uh, that is what we use. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I think we have time for two more. Sure. Come on, I know you have some. If you're shy, you can come up to me afterwards. Uh, well, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Marat. You've been a great audience.